that leads us to uh, now to some a bit of moderated discussion and I'm going to sort of abuse the position of the of the moderator to cheat and get a few questions in before the audience does. So the audience there's a, a lot of interest in this topic so the audience has had a number of different questions that we'll make sure we get to as much as possible. Uh, but I did want to start um, and this is an area that Greg touched on. So Greg, maybe you can just uh, very briefly touch on it uh, because you already did reference it in your remarks. And, but I'd like to hear the thoughts of, of the other three. Uh, and this is in particular to uh, the new upcoming um, US administration. Um, uh, as Greg touched on, he doesn't feel like there's gonna be much structural change necessarily with a new Biden administration. Um, do you, from the perspective, from the European perspective, I, I know Ken in Japan, uh, people are focused on this quite a bit. Um, do you see there being any real um, effective change to the US Indo-Pacific approach? And then how are your different regions kind of looking to respond to this with a new Biden administration? Or is this sort of something that you're just, you feel it's steady as she goes and, uh, and you're not overly concerned uh, or, or thinking that there's gonna be any big qualitative change. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll start with Ken, if that's okay, and then I'll, uh, I'll proceed to the next one. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. And uh, as I briefly touched upon in my uh, initial remark, uh, that uh, I think the Indo-Pacific concept uh, has its own gravity. And uh, I, I think one of the initiator uh, to create the gravity was obviously the Trump administration, uh, who incorporated this concept into the national security strategy and uh, following up of any kinds of security and economic engagement uh, under the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, concept. But I, uh, I think that uh, in, in terms of uh, applying into the strategic competition with China and also the alliance part and the partnership uh, approaches, I, th I guess that there has been uh, some more like uh, alternative uh, uh, paths uh, to be uh, pursued by the Biden uh, administration in terms of uh, overcoming the, the comprehensive non-zero-sum relationship uh, with China. There will be a pursuant of uh, uh, you know, seeking a cooperation with China on the global issues like uh, climate change and uh, also co cooperation on the international organization that uh, Greg uh, briefly also touched upon. And so that uh, you know, the comprehensively applying to the free and open aspect on the Indo-Pacific concept will be uh, somewhat reviewed. Uh, and, and also in the case of alliance and partnership uh, approaches. And I think that uh, many of those political psyche uh, of the US to deal with the alliance has been pretty much personalized uh, with the President Trump preferences to how to have a, uh, you know, the bilateral deal even among those, uh, you know, alliance relationship. And I, I believe that, that there, will, there will be a more like a systematic bureaucratic approaches uh, will follow by the professionalisms and also uh, the, the uh, prior to the pr Trump administration, there has been an approach called the pivot and rebalancing um, in Asia. And that is not only to rebalance the US commitment uh, in Asia, but also emphasizing the internal dynamics among those ally allies and partnership. Uh, and, and those could be uh, probably, uh, you know, systematically generated under the Biden's uh, approach. Streaming is on. Well, thanks so much, Ken. That's very, uh, very helpful comments, and uh, and I think really sums up all of similar things that I I feel about um, about how this new administration might look. And I think, I mean, if you think even about uh, the moniker uh, "Make America Great Again" or MAGA, I think uh, maybe we can change that to "Make Alliances Great Again." I, I agree. It's going to be a alliance first sort of focus. I think you've seen that uh, even with the the uh, the new picks that. Uh, the Biden administration has made for Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, et cetera. So I think that's going to be a focus. Uh, Eva, uh, what's your kind of thoughts on uh, the new administration coming into Washington and um, how it may intersect with Indo-Pacific issues, maritime issues? Do you see any sort of any reason to think that there might be any change? Well, for the transatlantic relations, it's definitely good news because simply it was difficult to get any worse than it was, uh, to be to be very honest. And we can assume that under the kind of preference or re we can assume that the Biden administration will return uh, or, or shift the priority also uh, to Europe and, and kind of you know, hold it in a different esteem. 
Uh, for the Indo-Pacific more broadly, I think the return to multilateralism is a very good news uh, for the region, simply in a change of a method. We don't expect that the core um, the basic of the policy is going to change dramatically, but the means are probably going to change. And you can see with the announcements that support Southeast Asian countries, for instance, also in dealing with China, uh, I think that that's very good news. Uh, and the emphasis on working with alliance, uh, allies and partners is uh, is something that um, that will probably steer the dynamic uh, in the Indo-Pacific in a different direction, because it is not just the uh, United States being back, but it is United States being back in a different world than four years ago, because a lot of those partners and allies have already made their way. Uh, we can see how the, the relationship has changed with, with uh, Japan, for instance. Japan has kind of, uh, I would say, emancipated itself, but really has taken a, an upper hand in, in the relationship. Uh, there has been a lot of progress on the European side, on the Australian side. So a lot of those traditional allies and partners have matured in a way and, and, and taken a more uh, autonomous or, or, or a different approach to regional security. So I think uh, now, Amer new America being back uh, also needs to deal with a slightly different partnership environment in the region. And overall, I think it can uh, bring a slightly um, a better uh, or more positive light in, in to the, uh, into the security environment. It's also much easier for them, for many of these countries, to work with the Biden administration than it was with the previous ones. It's, it's, let's say, um, a different choice. It's not really a choice between two evils, but it's, it seems like a, a lesser evil somehow and, and a more open-minded evil. Thanks, Eva. Yeah, that's a really important point, I think, about the U.S. being back, but uh, things have changed in four years. You know, structurally, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the alliances and partnerships remain solid and intact, but I think there are, have been significant developments. And I think, in particular, on the broader strategic light, and I think of trade agreements, uh, whether it's uh, the new RCEP that's been signed, obviously, TPP. Um, yeah, the, the region has moved in, in some different directions, and I think uh, the U.S. will have to kind of find ways to kind of work back with uh, some of its traditional partners on those. Um, so really important points. Um, Commodore Leary, could I have uh, some of your comments uh, on, from a Canadian perspective, how we may be thinking about a new Biden administration and how it's approaching uh, the Indo-Pacific? So. Sorry, you're on mute, uh, sir. Now I've got it going. The, the US has been able to run the Pacific on what was for 40 years on what's called the hub and spoke system where they were able to almost unilaterally direct the West's response out of Hawaii and Indo-Pacific Command. And I think there's probably a willingness to change that. And certainly in comparison to the Trump administration, brackets, which by the way, did a superb job in reversing uh, the Obama's failure to support places like the Philippines over Scarborough Shoal and the like. But the Trump administration, on the other hand, you know, has been accused probably quite correctly of running a protection racket with its allies like Korea and Japan. And if you put that in a Canadian context, it's conduct abandoning the Kurds. You know, I, as a former policy officer, as a fleet commander, would just dread the idea of the U.S. calling for a multinational operation under the Trump administration and trying to get political support. Gosh, at the same time, they also called Canadian steel a security threat. All of that changes now, but it's a double-edged sword. Um, I think Canada will, will, I think Canada will be far readier to support the US in a multinational naval operation. Uh, but I'm also worried that in Canada, uh, we won't be feeling the pressure to back that up with the necessary investments um, in our military to respond to such a request. Uh, that all remains to be seen and let's all be positive about this. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, um, Greg, do you have just some very quick thoughts on this uh, to add on to what you put uh, forward uh, in your initial remarks? Yeah, I, look, I, I think everybody's nailed it. Um, the The biggest uh, impetus under, under the Biden administration is going to be to approach the Indo-Pacific and the China challenge through a coalition-based 
effort and having far more, um, well, ha kind of having the allies already like-minded in a sense on, on uh, the scale of the China challenge and having them have spent the last four years having to step out um, in a sense because of the Trump administration, as the just put it, their protection racket approach to the alliances, particularly with Korea and Japan, is a helpful starting point. You know, early on, you'll have efforts by the Biden administration to, to renegotiate a host nation support agreement with Japan, which was going to be a nightmare under Trump. I imagine they can do better with, with the Koreans. And I think Evans right, the biggest change is going to be on the transatlantic relationship, which we don't talk about enough in the context of the Indo-Pacific. But whether it's on the South China Sea or the East China Sea or Taiwan, or certainly trade issues, if China is going to be convinced to change its behavior, it's going to have to be through an international coalition. And that means you have to keep Europe engaged. And the Trump administration made no effort to engage Europe on, on the Indo-Pacific in any substantive way. I'll just follow up very quickly on what uh, what Greg just said on the transatlantic cooperation. I think there's much to be done actually in the Indo-Pacific and the transatlantic, you know, communicating consultation on on Indo-Pacific issues uh, within the transatlantic context. As one uh, actor that we never actually mentioned and is very little uh, mentioned in the Indo-Pacific is NATO. Uh, we see uh, an increasing number of uh, Asian uh, powers, including Australia and Japan, being associated uh, with NATO and having some sort of associated relationship. So I think that that's something, this whole transatlantic dynamic within the Indo-Pacific context is something to be watched, uh, to, wor to be worked on and to be watched very closely, because hopefully uh, there are some positive developments uh, there, also on trade issues. I'm not sure if Jonathan is back. I, I think we we've still lost them. I'd, I'd also like to, to jump in at one more point. Um, the uh, Commodore raised the Commodore raised the issue of of the Philippines. And I think we don't talk about this enough because uh, you know in the next few months, one of the first jobs of the Biden administration is going to be that they have to renegotiate the visiting forces agreement with the Philippines. It's still on a clock in August, August eighteenth, I think. The U.S. Philippines VFA dies, and with it. The enhanced defense cooperation agreement and fundamentally the mutual defense treaty because if the u.s has to defend filipino forces from guam and okinawa it can't actually defend filipino forces this is a huge problem and i would caution against historical revisionism about where this this problem came from you know the the obama administration to its credit visited the philippines a lot signed and, and negotiated edca back the philippine case before the arbitration award the Trump administration for two and a half years didn't even appoint uh, Assistant Secretary for Asia in the State Department. So all of this focus on alliances in the Indo-Pacific has come about in the last 18 months of the administration, largely driven entirely by Mike Pompeo and his anti-China rhetoric. It's been somewhat helpful, but the fact that he stood on a tarmac last year and said we're going to support the Philippines and the South China Sea, it was great. But there's not a lot underneath of that statement, right? The work, the fact that, that we're still 1,300 miles away in Okinawa doesn't get talked about enough. All people want to do is cheer the fact that we've said that Article 5 applies to the Spratleys. But we don't have any forces anywhere close to the Spratly Islands. So that's the biggest kind of weak read uh, when it comes to our Indo-Pacific strategy that's not getting talked about. And one of the hardest, given that it's the Duterte government. And this is a, a Democratic administration is going to have to figure out how to deal with a serial human rights abuser slash your oldest ally in Asia at one and the same time. Well, thanks a lot, Greg, and apologies for popping off there. A power outage has happened, I guess. Uh, and that's why I got someone who wrote a book on uh, the South China Sea to be a moderator, so he, he could improv in, in this emergency situation. So yeah, thanks uh, for those comments. Um, the next that we're the moderate discussion to kind of bundle a couple of these next questions. And they, they segue well into this discussion of coalitions and partnerships and how the U.S. is going to look at dealing much more with, uh, with a group of, of like-minded countries to deal with these issues. So the first one is, you know, obviously we'd love to have a, an Indo-Pacific discussion with, uh, with everyone here, but uh, we're limited on time. So how about some of the nations that we haven't yet discussed? Uh, for example, India, uh, Australia, Vietnam, uh, but also I'm intrigued in your thoughts on South Korea and how it might want to interplay with such a strategy. I think there's been a lot of sentiments that South Korea has been uh, has been cautious about getting too involved in the Indo-Pacific approaches 
um, number one, for a fear of, uh, of inflaming its relationship with China, which is already tenuous, but also perhaps uh, with its tensions with Japan and its feeling that the Indo-Pacific approaches might uh, have a Japanese uh, intellectual background. Um, so that's sort of my first part of the question. And I think dovetailed into that is, is the discussion of the Quad and the quadrilateral dialogue. Um, and it seems to me, you know, the Quad is finally reborn. Uh, now, uh, but still a sort of a tepid rebirth. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's working much more quietly, uh, much more in a focused manner. Um, and to me seems sort of as a necessary, but not necessarily sufficient answer uh, to a lot of these challenges for, uh, you know, in a ways of minilateral and multilateral ways to approach it. So what do you see, uh, number one, how do you kind of see a lot of these other countries working in these frameworks? And number two, how do you see the future of the Quad? Uh, is this something that you feel will 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 grow naturally beyond the Quad, uh, or is that something that should exist in its current formation? And then there are other minilateral groupings that can uh, that can involve uh, the Europeans, potentially Canada, and others. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll actually start with Eva on this, if that's okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of what I call flexible minilateralism. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, I think everyone has been talking about some sort of flexible multilateralism or flexibility in general. And we see a lot of flexibility in the Indo-Pacific concept, which kind of means that not everyone needs to embrace the, the terminology of Indo-Pacific to embrace some of the core values that it stands for. I mean, you know, being on, on, on the side of a country or, or a block that was really reluctant just to even mention the word uh, for a very long time doesn't mean that we were not you know, promoting the values of it or, or kind of, you know, engaging in the game uh, differently. So I don't think that Korea or some of those other countries will change their mind drastically for all the reasons that you mentioned politically. Uh, but the question is whether it's really necessary because you can continue working uh, with, with those partners on you know, different levels. And that's why I wanted to bring up uh, some of those non-traditional uh, security issues or, or functional security issues, because typically Europeans work with Koreans on piracy in the, sun, in, in the Gulf of Aden, for instance, on crisis prevention, et cetera, et cetera. We don't necessarily need to you know, put everyone into the Indo-Pacific basket if they don't want or cannot do so uh, for, for obvious reasons. And I think that the minilateral solution is, is uh, and, and this flexibility is really a, a way to go, uh, simply. I mean, Quad has been, frankly, uh, off-putting for uh, uh, quite a few countries. Uh, let's let's uh, say it uh, frankly. France has been uh, solicited to, uh, since the beginning of the re reborn uh, renaissance of, of uh, Quad, and it's been quite straightforward in uh, in, in uh, saying it will not join. But it is a very close uh, partner, security strategic partner with all the four members. Bilaterally, it has the most developed uh, security strategic ties with Japan, with India and Australia and the United States. And they train uh, bilaterally, trilaterally, quadrilaterally, you name it, multilaterally, Malabar, they're, they're, they're in there. Uh, but they just don't want to join the quad. And I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, we, we talk about this quad plus all the time. Um, I don't think that, you know, it, it's really just a matter of branding um, and, and quad plus has a certain strategic connotation that some countries don't necessarily want to want to want to get on board with and it's perfectly fine to work uh, kind of loosely with anyone that shares uh, the same concerns on ad hoc issues i find yeah thanks that's great comments uh, eva and i would agree i mean i think one of the things that i my thought of the quad 1.0 and even as it's kind of developing again uh, is it should focus much less on the sort of the um, the atmospherics. So basically, you know, getting the ministers together, getting the big, uh, uh, you know, the, the photos and the press statements, and much more at the tangible level, at the working level. So again, as some would say, at the boring level, but that is the, the boring levels where, where things actually matter and things actually happen. So whether this is at the director general level or... Um, or assistant secretary level, having those dialogues where you can work on issues such as capacity building, et cetera. I think that is much more impactful than sending necessarily political statements uh, exclusively at the ministerial level. Um, okay, can I uh, move to Ken to have your thoughts on others outside of the Quad and also the Quad, how you kind of see these different frameworks uh, working in the next coming months? Yeah, 
Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I basically agree uh, with the uh, many of aspects that uh, Eva uh, laid out, uh, that uh, something that you are seeing today uh, is the evolution of the flexible uh, sets of multilateralism, uh, and including Quad. And uh, there has been a significant uh, development of the, the functional cooperation among the Quad members and having a uh, uh, you know, naval exercises and uh, uh, also more like a periodical uh, sharing of the information among the uh, Joint Chiefs and Defense Ministers. And those are the significant development that uh, we have had so far. Uh, but uh, when you talk about some, like a U.S. senior official mentioned about the future potential of having uh, Asia version of NATO, type of uh, institutionalization, I think we are way, way behind uh, from that kind of perspective of having uh, institutionalization based on Indo-Pacific uh, cooperation. And I think that the Indo-Pacific cooperation uh, can be best performed uh, with uh, more like a, a, a non-official uh, flexible uh, cooperation based on the uh, common interests rather than pursuing the rigid rule-based uh, in institutionalism. So I think that is the uh, basic, uh, I think, a characterization of what we had on the Indo-Pacific uh, cooperation. And I may uh, would like to mention a few about uh, South Korea. Uh, and I think uh, the Jonathan is best qualified uh, to uh, talk about the role played uh, by South Korea. But uh, I think that uh, Korea, you know, the basic kind of priority that they have is obviously that in the Korean Peninsula, North South relationships still play a predominant role uh, in their uh, policy priorities. But they are seeming to expand that regional engagement view uh, through a number of initiatives, uh, including their uh, new southbound, uh, you know, southbound diplomacy, and also their, uh, you know, the policy engagement in the economic uh, cooperation schemes, uh, including their intention to uh, be part of the TPP negotiations in, in recent manner. And also they uh, also be part of the, uh, you know, uh, including the maritime uh, security uh, uh, aspects as well by engaging many of the, those defense industries in, in Southeast Asia and also uh, joining some of those uh, minilateral uh, cooperation between them so that there will be a high potential uh, that, uh, you know, even having a kind of low profile uh, Japan Korea relationship that really ha has been a stumbling block to have a so called a virtual uh, cooperation among the US Japan uh, Korea relationship. But, but by expanding the viewpoint of the regional engagement, there will be, a, I think, high potential that the Korea uh, also could be a part of the larger uh, cooperation framework as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim Basana. They got some really good points. And I think on Korea, and maybe I'll go to Greg next on this, but I think uh, he alluded to this as well, that I think one of the big priorities uh, for the upcoming U.S. administration, I think, will be to sort of mend some of the wounds in, in that alliance relationship. And that may provide an opening um, uh, for the U.S. to kind of uh, work together much more uh, closely with uh, South Korea on its uh, Indo-Pacific approach. So it may provide an opening for, for South Korea to work more with countries such as Japan, despite those tensions. Uh, so, Greg, um, what's your kind of thoughts on this? On Again, you spend much of the year usually pre-pandemic uh, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Where, uh, how are different countries in that region looking at the quad? Uh, obviously, there seems to be some um, some suspicion of it. Um, but uh, but what are some of the frameworks going forward? Do you think that there's other ways outside the quad? Is a quad plus possible? I'm um, interested in your thoughts. Yeah. So the first um, the first thing I would say is that we have to get uh, comfortable with with kind of messy multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific these days, the idea that there is a singular answer and that we're somehow aiming toward it. And if we can bring all of these these strings together, we'll have it. That's that's a fantasy, I think. And, and the quad is a pretty good example of that, right? The quad is, a, at the moment, a very useful high-level diplomatic venue. I think it's going to be increasingly useful in coordinating maritime security, among other issues, in the Indo-Pacific or in, in the Indian Ocean. The idea that we're going to operationalize the quad for some real-world effects to the east of the Malacca Strait seems like a fantasy to me. And, and Delhi is pretty painfully clear that they have little interest in doing that. Um, the rest of us just need to listen. 
if if we look at you know uh, what are what are we going to see from from Korea, you see much the same. Korea is going to be very useful on a lot of issues, but you know. South Korean Sea is not going to be one of them, for instance. I mean, they'll they'll speak up diplomatically, softly, but they're not going to be doing any operational uh, assertions. And in Southeast Asia, one of the things we have to accept is that there has to be a two-track approach to engagement with our Southeast Asian partners. It, ASEAN is an important smart bet for the long-term security of the region. If you're looking for a way to build regional architecture, that's the only possible core. There's just not enough strategic trust in Northeast Asia to do it and India doesn't have any interest. So invest in ASEAN, but don't think ASEAN is your answer to everything. And the South China Sea is a good example. The US should not think, and neither should any other partner, that ASEAN is gonna solve South China Sea issues. No, you do that bilaterally by engaging the Philippines, Vietnam, and maybe Singapore. And everybody else is academic to that discussion. Um, one of the things that's, that's painfully clear increasingly is Vietnam's frustration with ASEAN itself. We did a, a survey of strategic elites across the region earlier this year. And one of the questions was, what's your preferred uh, venue for, for regional security architecture? And every ASEAN country overwhelmingly said ASEAN, except for Vietnam, which said the quad. Vietnam's not even part of a quad, but Vietnamese elites are so disillusioned with ASEAN that they would rather invest their their face in, in India helping solve problems in the South China Sea. So that's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a my, my messy way of saying we need to get comfortable with with the idea that that we're going to have to engage in a whole lot of venues, bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, that generally point in the same direction, but they're not all going to be equally useful on on singular issues. And one of the ways to to frame this, perhaps as as Kamala Leary uh, suggested, is that it's an evolution for the U.S. at least from our old idea of a hub and spokes. Now, now we have multiple hubs. Some of them don't even involve the United States, and that's fine. They are all generally pointed toward trying to get Beijing to rise within the system rather than without it. And so, you know, let, let a thousand flowers bloom, and that's fine. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and uh, of the the hub and spokes, and the the ones that aren't even, are not even U.S. centric now. And I think one of the benefits is uh, I think Eva mentioned that you know four years will pass, and the U.S. will have to sort of adjust to some of the the changes that have been happening. Some of them are in their favor. I mean, if you think, for example, of the Australia Japan relationship and how strong that relationship has. Obviously, there is a trilateral mechanism to work with the U.S. Uh, but there's also a trilateral mechanism to work uh, with India that does not include the U.S. So I think there's there's a lot of overlapping mini laterals there that can uh, that can work in U.S. favor. Um, so I think uh, I, I did have one extra question, but I think I'm going to push that and go straight to the audience questions because uh, this is a, this is a question that also the audience is very interested in. So I think that we'll cover cover that uh, in the audience portion. And the audience is, uh, has a, a range of, of interesting questions that they put forward. And I think I'll put forward the first one, which kind of looks very closely at, at, uh, at the one that I had was interested in. And this is focused on Canada and its role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and I think it's really focused on, so is some of this tilt or is Canada's sort of role in the Indo-Pacific sustainable from a resource perspective? Is this something that um, not only from a resource perspective, I know this is something Commodore Leary would be very interested in, in, um, in looking at, but is this something that Canada can really see itself um, sustaining as a policy, as being an active member in the Indo-Pacific? Is this something that we can do more than just pay lip service to? Um, so maybe I'll start with uh, with Commodore Leary, uh, and then uh, and then go around. Thank you very much, and very important to look at the resources. The you know people in Canada suggest joining the Quad, and I think for all the reasons that have just been discussed, you know, it's not ready for us, and we're not ready for it. Uh, given our weakness of our uh, China policy, why would you want us? And two. Our resources are limited, and for the longest time, we have sought access to the uh, ASEAN subgroups of the East Asia Summit and the Association of Defense Ministers Plus, and we've been told quite bluntly, you know, your presence in the region does not support your call for membership. So what can be done about that? Well, I, I, I'm not waiting for us to reach 2% defense spending. Uh, but certainly there are small things we can do. We have uh, an ambassador uh, to ASEAN in Indonesia. Uh, 
I'll bet he has no staff at all dedicated to this. He certainly does not have something like uh, our NATO cell, where he'd be supported by a three-star admiral or, or general who could go to all these meetings because we're not even attending the meetings now. Uh, second, within our current resources, we can do a far better job of rebalancing things towards the Pacific. Uh, and this has been called for, and it's about time we start to make sure that the West Coast fleet has the same resources as the Atlantic fleet. Um, I think there's, you, we can also look at a, a range of options where we can contribute. Uh, looking at maritime surveillance, you know, there's been an attempt, I understand, for ASEAN to set up a, a maritime cell. And most of the countries probably suffer from a lack of inability to see what precisely is going on with their region. Well, Canada should be helping out with staff and money in that regard. Um, we should certainly uh, support any call for the Americans uh, who are already doing a great functional multilateralism with the US Navy, be it from uh, the Organization of Freedom of Navigation Supports to RIMPAC. Uh, well, I think the next step may well be the, the, the first fleet uh, initiative, if that takes wind. And I think that's about all I'll say and leave it to the rest. Okay, uh, but that's perfect. Thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, so for others, I mean, you don't have to spend a long on this. I, I know some of you may not be Can Canadian uh, defense or naval experts, but um, from an outside perspective, uh, how do you see you know Canada in the Indo-Pacific? Do you see this as something, you know, when you're thinking of the different countries that should be involved in these coalitions? What's your, just kind of what's your sort of elevator pitch or your sort of, you know, 30 second uh, thought on uh, on Canada in this region. So maybe if I'll start with Ken and, uh, and then I'll go to Greg and Eva. Well, thank you very much. I, I think Canada has been a long standing Asia Pacific power, especially since 1980s, uh, involving a lot of like a multilateral uh, economic uh, cooperation. And uh, Canada is part of the TPP, and that also brings in the very important standard sector uh, for the high quality uh, trade and investment uh, regional order. So Canada is, uh, you know, entirely qualified uh, to become, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific uh, state uh, in that regard. And secondly, several um, already mentioned that the Canada has been also been part of the lots of like, uh, uh, you know, joining in the exercises and uh, being part of those uh, presence operation. Uh, that will bring in the collective pressure uh, to be sent out, uh, especially to uh, Beijing, what kind of the maritime order uh, and the safety measures uh, to be implemented by having a Canadian uh, participation. That is also important. And in third, uh, there will be a lot of demands uh, for the capacity uh, building, uh, especially for the maritime security in the coastal area in ASEAN and also South, uh, South Asia. Uh, on those part, I think Canadian expertise and also the capacity and resources can also be a part of a huge, I think, value added aspects. And in, in those, I think there will be a lot of potential that the Canada can explore uh, even though the you know resource uh, is uh, uh, said to be limited, but I think that uh, there will be a lot of potential uh, that uh, Canada will uh, increase the presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And I think it's an important point. Uh, you know, while the from the defense side and the naval side, obviously there are resource um, constraints. I think that when we're looking at a, even from a security perspective, an Indo-Pacific security approach that encompasses maritime issues. Um, it need not be focused all on what the, the Navy can do. I think there's a really large element to that, even from the diplomacy side, that really is not so intensive on, on costs and resources that would have a big impact. And, you know, I use one example of when, um, when China declared its uh, air defense identification zone in the East China Sea. I believe that was in 2013. And uh, when, that, uh, when that declaration happened, uh, our uh, declaration or our sort of statement uh, after that was very, very late. I think it was some six or eight weeks late and things like that. Um, those are not necessarily resource issues. I mean, that it's not that it requires uh, a multitude of resources to get those statements out quickly, but those sort of things uh, show a clarity of purpose of, of how, what, how we're looking and how we're thinking about our partners and allies in that region. So those things I think can be done on the cheap um, and just need to be focused uh, much more closely. Um, so thank you for those comments. Uh, uh, Greg, do you have any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, look, I'd say that Canada is uh, as important a middle power as any other except perhaps Australia and Japan in this context. And Australia and Japan have the benefit of geography, right? Australia, Canada does as much diplomatically and largely operationally as any of the European powers. And if we are, and now that's not spread evenly across all domains, of course, I'd argue the French do more on naval instance, for instance, but France has never called for China to comply with the South China Sea Award. Canada did the day it was issued. Uh, the UK did, but it took them two years. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues on which we could complain about Canadian uh, policy, but there's also a lot of issues on which, on which Canada deserves laurels. And, uh, you know, Canada's a member of Five Eyes, on and on. If the goal is to incentivize Beijing to change its behavior on a number of fronts, then Canada has to be part of that coalition because it has to be a global effort. It cannot be the US, Australia, and Japan alone, which is what it has often been painted as on a number of these issues. And Canada, you know, look, the, the Michaels are about to spend another Christmas in uh, detention precisely because Canada refuses to buckle to Chinese pressure. Uh, Canada deserves kudos for that. So I'll, I'll save my slings and arrows for my own administration uh, and not, not cast them at Ottawa. Thanks so much. And thanks again for mentioning the Michaels. Uh, we're just, uh, this week is the uh, the two year anniversary of that. And I think a lot of us who've, who've been able to engage with uh, Michael Kovrig at different conferences, uh, continue to, to think about him and his family at this time. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, as you said, we are kind of caught in the crossfire of this. Uh, so it's, uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, Eva, did you have any sort of thoughts on this uh, point on Canada and the indo -Pacific? Actually do just quickly, because when we say resources, I think I might be in, in a minority when thinking on other things than just military and, and naval, to be honest. And it was said uh, here, it, it's, the, it's the diplomatic engagement, it's the financial engagement, but it's also the, the intellectual input that you see in, in, in Canada's contribution in a lot of the multilateral discussions that we see in the region. Uh, every time I, we speak about the Canadian involvement in, in Asia security, I can't help but think of my PhD research, which was on provisional measures to uh, territorial disputes, to settling territorial disputes in, in East Asia. And some of my case studies were uh, the Gulf of Thailand initiative and the workshops on the South China Sea in the 90s run by uh, Pakashim Jalal. Both of those initiatives were actually financed by and initiated by Canada. Uh, and we don't uh, often remind ourselves of this. And I had huge respect for those initiatives. Then they were, frankly, if you if you study the South China Sea long enough, um, some of the biggest breakthroughs and and the first uh, first ones, the first series that run what for nine years at that time, um, that really made some some progress and and chartered some of the the, the new uh, approaches to to this to those issues. So it, it's really not necessarily about the, the, the gunboats on the ground. It's, uh, it's really just, it's sometimes about, uh, you know, innovative solutions. And I find Canada, same as sometimes Europeans or New Zealand, um, are part of those countries that really can contribute to, to regional security through, through those means. Well, thanks. And thanks for kind of uh, going back and reaching into that history, because I think that's something uh, a lot of the Canadian intellectuals do kind of uh, hold as a pen of pride, but nobody really no notices that or knows that, uh, or very few do. So we're really happy that you kind of reference that. And I think it's important too, to not, you know, to give ourselves a little bit of credit too. I think on the intellectual side, there is a role that we can play too. Um, Canada hasn't necessarily been the most active uh, recently, unfortunately, in CSCAP, for example, but that's a forum that traditionally uh, we were very active at from the beginning, uh, and we hope to get more and more uh, engaged and active in, in bodies like that, and also sort of more sort of one-off summitry processes such as the Shangri-La Dialogue, I think is a real role for a lot of us and, uh, and intel public intellectuals and uh, academics at, at these events too. So there's it's more than just as I said, the Navy or just even the dip diplomatic side, I think this is something that uh, that those outside of uh, government can also play a role in. Uh, 